Hello and welcome back to the channel. Um, I have been promising for quite a bit to talk a little more about 15th century uh, information that we have and uh, how much of what is out there is reliable real information and how much of it is figment of somebody's imagination. Not that I'm completely opposed to figments of imagination, but I should be kept under control and not go on too wild of a goose chase. And of course, as usual, the fault for this series of talks was actually a ship model, specifically the numerous kits of Santa Maria. And what are they based on? And the simple truth is they're based on nothing. So let's talk a little bit about what sorts of information we do have about this period. It is not nearly as much as we would like it to be, but it is not quite nothing at all. And uh, just to make it clear, we will be talking about the Mediterranean, southern world, because that is what gave also the so-called and more rather misnomed uh, Atlantic she seafaring tradition. Most of it is based on Mediterranean shipbuilding traditions. Towards the end of the series, I will also address where likely this tradition originated the recording. So, without further ado, let us jump into it. First and foremost, of course, in my list of importance is physical remains of ships. That is the final word on something. Because, ladies and gentlemen, in uh, treaties, in historical documents, we can read until we are blue in the face. But these documents are either showing us what people planned to do, or what they wanted others, their supervisors, for example, to think they were doing. This is not necessarily what was actually happening, always. Ultimately, as my professor um, Fred Hocker used to say, ultimately, the guy who shapes the ship is the guy with the axe cutting the timbers, and not necessarily the treatise that is being followed. That is true even for later periods. Many, many years ago, I had the very great pleasure of sitting with Peter Goodwin inside the hold of the Victory on her keelson and discussing the framing pattern of the ship. We have it documented ad nauseum. We have original drawings, we have original specifications, but what is actually in the ship does not fully match what is in the documents, according to Peter Goodwin. So if that is happening for a vessel that we know so much about, that is still with us, imagine how much more this is the case with older vessels. So, first and foremost in importance would be archaeological remains. Well-preserved archaeological remains. I will get back to this shortly. Iconography falls together in the group with representative models at the time. Basically, these are the images. They may or may not be focusing on the ship. Some may be technically believable, some may not be technically believable. We have to analyze what the artist is really trying to tell us with this. Is the artist interested in the details of the ship? Was he a shipwright, for example? Is he interested in the fable, in the story in which the ships take part? Is the artist working on contemporary vessels or is he attempting to represent something from the past? That all has influence into how the ship is represented. And in truth, a truly portraiture of ships does not emerge until the 17th century with the great Dutch masters of the Baroque. By there, you can take iconography as valuable, serious historical document. For any other period, especially the earlier period, uh, there are some indications, but you should recognize what is that you're looking at and what the artist was attempting to do with this. Then, of course, there are ship models, and lo and behold, there are very, very few models surviving from this period. In fact, I can think of only one. And that, of course, has been um, used as inspiration by numerous ship modelers, including by those who like to model one-to-one -one fantasy ships, like the so-called replicas of Santa Maria, Nina Pinta, etc. I'll get back to it in just a moment. Then, 
they are the documents. In this period, most of the documents fall into two categories. They can either be contracts for ship building. We have a full uh, representation of contracts from the 13th century, for example, between the French King Louis IX, otherwise known as King Louis, uh, the uh, Saint Louis, for his uh, ill-fated crusade into North Africa. He hired uh, the Genoese to build an entire fleet for him. And we do have quite a lot of the specifications for the ships surviving in the contracts in the Genoese archives. John Pryor, the great medieval historian, has made few day out of these documents and has brought them to light and published them in numerous places at great detail and has also gone as far as interpreting and offering reconstructions of what these contracts may have looked like. Up to that point, that was really, until very recently, until 2016 to be exact, this was really the most accurate or the closest that we could get to what medieval uh, merchant ships could have looked like. After 2016, however, we do have archaeological evidence now from the Black Sea, perhaps subject of a different conversation, since it is a little bit earlier than our chosen 15th century. As far as other documents, uh, they are our list of dimensions, they are the port uh, toll, records, wherever they survive, they give us something about dimensions of vessels, something about the nomenclature of vessels, but hardly any serious technical detail. Then, finally, in the 15th century, emerges a tradition of, build, of writing ship treatises. This is a very interesting tradition because a number of questions arise from this tradition. The first question, of course, is what was the purpose? Why did they write them? And who wrote them? One of the earliest, and probably at the moment one of the best studied by now, is a treatise written by a Greek, who ironically is known by his Italian knight, or rather Venetian name, Michele di Rodi, which of course means Michael of Rhodes. Uh, he probably would have pronounced Michalis or something along these lines. Although he originated in Rhodes, he spent virtually his entire active career from about 1401 onwards in the service of Venice. He grew up in the service, he enlisted as an oarsman, and eventually he would captain and lead even squadrons in Venetian service. He wrote a uh, large manuscript that is dealing with everything that you can imagine. From mathematics, through geography, to navigation, to operation of fleets, um, astrology, pretty much talking about a uh, Renaissance man, this is it. This is exactly the style of Renaissance treatises. They deal with everything that the author thought interesting, that the author knew about, or thought it would be curious to read about. Significant portion of this treatise, however, is, luckily for us, dedicated to shipbuilding. And it studies a grand total of five vessels that are described in fair detail, although the detail manages to change between uh, the different ships. Three of these vessels are galleys. Two merchant and one normal war galley in the service of Venice. Two of the vessels are square riggers. Nothing in Michele di Rodi's manuscript suggests that this is the first time that anyone ever thought of producing such a treatise. In fact, Michele does not claim this. It is quite clear that he is using other material that was available to him, presumably somewhere in the libraries. If he was writing in the 1430s, and this is not something new, it means that others were already beginning to put down on paper, or vellum, or whatever it, uh, the medium was, their thoughts on shipbuilding. So were the treatises, here this is how you design a ship, let me teach you how to design a ship, or were the treatises more, here is how you record and pass on information about shipbuilding. In other words, this is one of the biggest 
conversations or debates in maritime archaeology. Namely, what is the purpose of these treatises? And uh, who are the writers of these treatises? And what is this information supposed to convey? It has been argued by some that the treatises, especially the early versions of these, were not really to teach you how to design a vessel, but it was a method of recording good designs and keeping the memory alive. It was essentially a specification for a ship, not here, let me teach you how to build one. And that is the impression that one gets from these treatises, because as you read them, they do provide a lot of information in them. They provide uh, ways of calculating lengths, uh, the relationships between length and beam. They provide even in some instances the relationships between some of the scantlings, uh, the timbers that can uh, strike the, uh, the vessel. However, in very few places do they tell you, let me show you how to shape a vessel. They give you data for a specific vessel. And Michele di Rodi is a prime example of this type of treatise. For example, here I would like to uh, show you, here are some of his tables. This is a facsimile edition. I probably should say a few words about how this was published in the early 2000s. A uh, grant was obtained and a group of scholars published the first volume of the book is what you see right here in my hands and it is in essence a reproduction, a facsimile edition of the book with photographs of the pages. Here you see the different offsets and dimensions that he's listing. This is for the first of the vessels he's discussing. It is a Galea di Flanders or Flanders galley, merchant galley that eventually will become the fathers of the Galeasses later in the 16th century. So this is the first volume, is just the facsimile edition. The second volume over here is dealing with the translation and transcription of the text of this. And it contains everything. It contains the shipbuilding as well as the other texts. Personally, I find it fascinating. Ship modelers are unlikely to be interested in other parts except the navigational and, of course, the shipbuilding sections. And the third final volume over there that you see is dealing with analysis and scholarly essays on the life of Michele di Rodi and on the different subjects that he is covering his treatise, including shipbuilding. These are done by some of the foremost scholars in the field, so are definitely worth reading. Naturally, initially the book was extremely expensive. Now you can find the volumes, especially if you're looking at them piece by piece, you can find them for reasonable cost. I'm not prepared to quote specific prices because obviously I have not looked uh, for quite a while, but I know that I bought them for less than third the original listed price. So those who shall seek shall find. And as this is the first of the big treatises that has survived and reached us, I believe that it will deserve an entire segment of this video for the week after, in which I will discuss Michele Di Rodi and the closest related texts to his. And in the final third series, or third episode, I suppose, of the series, we will be talking about the actual material culture surviving from the vessels. Or I may switch around, <laughs> depending on what uh, thought strikes me the next time I sit down to record. Thank you very, very much for watching. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next time when we will discuss these in more practical detail. Have wonderful Christmas holidays.